Howdy hackers and welcome to the next episode of Fairlight TV. Today the topic is one of my favorites. Um, it's cracking tapes on C64. Yes, I'm not sure I will reveal any major secrets, but I will at least invite you to some sort of view on how it's done and uh, what protection mechanisms are there and how to do it. So um, it will not be this game, but this is an example of a tape game. Why tape games? Well, f media being either tape or disc, if you look at what we in Europe cracked the most, it would need to be tapes because most of the games that came out on discs uh, were previously cracked by American groups. They tended to be very early with the disc games, whereas we were really early with the tape games. So, hence looking into tapes. Okay, so now over to um, Vice, where we will start looking at what I'm actually talking about here. So, uh, tape loaders contain of like two parts. The first is what's in kernel. Uh, the system is doing a load. And when system is doing a load, it first load a chunk of memory into, uh, the, which is the tape header. So it's basically saying, I found this on the tape. That is one byte for the um, type of file, two bytes for start of where the the file is supposed to be loaded and then there is uh, the end of the file and uh, as we will see later on that's not really needed uh, it could be populated with basically anything and then we have the name of of the program that will be prompted so you will see uh, found and then the name of what it actually found but the tape big, uh, buffer from 033C is bigger than, than these bytes needed for the actual like header, these parameters. There is a lot of space, so uh, all the commercial loaders are filling this with parts of the loader to come. So it doesn't need to load a lot of memory uh, to, to kickstart some sort of a proprietary loader because it has already parts of that loaded uh, inside the tape buffer. A very handy way of loading. And when that has kickstarted, almost all of the time in, in all the newer commercial loaders, kernel is no longer involved in anything. It doesn't use any part of kernel. Now the new loader has taken over. So what we will see here is um, uh, me trying to load Hunter's Moon. Um, yes, where is the mouse pointer? Oh, it's one of those things. Uh, so, <laughs> in the newer versions of Vice, if you press Alt-M, which is very normal for accessing the monitor as it was back in WinVice, but uh, no, that is grabbing mouse uh, movements. Very confusing. So it's actually Alt-H to enter the monitor here. So, if I let it start now, what will happen is that the tape would load and, and I will have no way to intervene in the loading process. The, the loading just starts and I'm out of the picture. I cannot control or, or steer that in any way. So that's not what we want to do. What, what we want to do is 63276 means load the tape header. Yes, and press play on tape. I need it's it's a band, but it's also an instruction for pressing play. And here we have the luxury of being able to speed this process up. So now it has loaded the header for Hunter's Moon. So no C and I will make sure that we don't have overlapping windows. No, we don't, so that's good. 03 was this parameter byte telling us that this is a non-relocatable file and then it should load to, to 029F and then it should load the end the load uh, at 033B which is just before here so it will load all the way up to the start of the tape buffer. I hope that was understandable and uh, and after that you have the the name of the tape 
hunter's moon which is the same as we see here as it found but then you see there is state after here so 033c and then we do m and then we do m and then we get into 0400 and that's the screen memory so uh this is from from the 20s here is where the screen memory starts i actually think the tape up for ends here it, it doesn't go all the way up to 0400 it it ends like here uh but this looks like could be code right uh, now we are also disassembling uh, the, the name of the file and all of that, so we don't really need that, but it still looks rather messy, doesn't it? Right? This is not really code. It, it's more like garbage. It's like when you try to disassemble like graphics. And the reason for this is we will have a look at 033C again. So what you do now is you do uh, 033C and then 039F, 12, 3B and then 13. So what I did here is I incremented the low byte and high byte with a thousand. And that means it doesn't load into the lower memory. And that means that it will not trigger the auto start. Okay, so now the other magical sys. 62828. That means continue to load. I don't know if you hear it, but I have the loading sound from tape on. Okay. Uh, 133C. So here... Uh, no, <laughs> of course not. So this is the, where the tape buffer would be if we would increment that with a thousand. But of course we're not doing that. So uh, 129F was where we would have our stuff. Okay, so I would imagine, and, and I haven't controlled this, but in a while. Um, so oh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that 02A6 is the actual start address. So the... The auto start mechanism used by this type of loader, and this is Cyberload by John Twitty, is launching 02A6. So it would be this, the Aura here. Very strange start mechanism, but yeah, I think that's it. And then it's doing set interrupt, clear screen, and then it's fiddling with color memory. And here it's also uh, fiddling with screen memory. And this is where you would say uh, loading cyber load and then, then you have something which is a bar ping ponging back and forth. So this is what it's doing here. And after this, uh, it's, it's doing an exclusive OR of 0350. So now it's starting to decrypt the data that, that is in the tape buffer. So that's what this is doing. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to go through Cyberload because that is a separate episode if we want to look through the very details of Cyberload. But, but so tape buffer is being decrypted. And what we now need to do is fiddle with this copy it back to low memory and then start it and we would need to have made adjustments to it so that we can regain control in a later stage of uh, the loading process uh, and, and i can of course do that but i will take the advantage of using more modern tool for this um, we will take a look at something called tapex which we can use to open a tap file and examine the details. So let's go over to Tapex. Okay, so I just booted up the program called Tapex by Tom SLC of Nostalgia. Uh, this is one of the like three programs of the same category. So Tapex, uh, Final Tap and Tap Clean. Tap Clean is more targeted towards cleaning up your tap file so if you make a raw dump from your tapes that one will sort of an do an analysis of the tape and it will be able to save that one out in a sort of a clean format tapex can do that as well but uh, it can also do other things so 
I would say TapClean is probably the most complex program. Uh, it's it's a portable piece of code, so it works in multiple environments. So if you're on Linux or, or Mac, that's probably the program for you. I think TapX is Windows only, uh, or at least since I'm Windows, that's what I have. And I think this works fine for the purpose I have. Uh, Final Tap used to be uh, a highly competitive programs, but for the time being, since it's not developed since a number of years, I would say TAPEX has taken over its position because TAPEX is doing everything that Final Tap is doing and more. So I don't see really any reason to do, to work with, with Final Tap anymore. Uh, okay, so what we do here is we're going to drag and drop uh, the main tap file onto here and it's doing an analysis of it yeah, this is a setting it doesn't really belong here but I've told Tom and he wants to have it there so yeah don't blame me I, I think it should go into some sort of options section okay and then you see um, a very very long list of the uh, the results of the parsing of this tap file you don't really need to see much of this, really. We will dig into this, but I would like to show you this first. So these are a number of parameters uh, that are specific to Cyberload. You can also see the graphics view of the pilot signal and data signal. I'm sure this tells somebody something. It doesn't tell me anything except that, yeah looks like skid marks but it's seemingly a tape loader and then you can set a number of settings here um, the only thing I would like to ensure that you have set is this link sequential blocks on export we will get back to that uh, very soon okay so view here you have a number of options here file details uh, and we will actually enable that for this one so now i've selected the cbm header as we've seen before this one loads the tape header from o33c up to o3fb yeah so now you know the uh, the address i was unsure about was o3fb that is the end of the tape buffer why not o3ff commodore logic i guess okay and then it's it's there twice for obvious commodore reasons it was too fast loading only once uh, and then the main file that was loaded from 09 sorry 029f and then 033a we've already seen that one in the machine code monitor previously and again it's loaded twice right uh, and now we're going to look at this one so a hex dump yeah this is the stuff it loaded we can also see a direct disassembly here. So 029F is loading and it's probably launching to 02A6, which is here, and 02A6, so the actual start is this. It's a very strange uh, instruction to start with, um, but here it is. And as we saw before, it's decrypting parts of the tape buffer. That's what it's doing here. And then it's doing something with timer ship. And, um, and then it's branching to 0351. So that's the start of the rest of the loader. That's everything we can see from here. If we want to see, because this is also something. And if we want to see the decrypted part of the of the cyber loaded uh, the cyber load that was just decrypted in in the tape buffer, then we actually need to do use the machine code monitor and set proper breakpoints and stop at particular times in the loading process to see what it has loaded and what it has decrypted and how it looks in the decrypted form. Uh, so here we have this very f first little Kickstarter, the, the, the boot file. This is here. What happens now is that it loads something to O2, uh, address 2 in memory, which is basically the first free address in memory uh, down in zero page. 
So it's loading this and here you also see a number of those uh, exclusive ores. So it's decrypting other stuff. And the purpose of this is not to dissect uh, Cyberload. Um, there might be a separate episode on that if there is enough request for that. because We can go through all of this. But for the purpose of this, it's just showing that uh, what it's doing here and showing a lot of the tricks it's using for this. Uh, here it's uh, overloading the lower part of stack memory. Um, the, the, well, I, I don't know if you want to say this is the higher or the lower. It, the beginning of the stack is uh, um, the first page of, of so page one of the memory. Uh, that's a, a very convenient way of patching, uh, of, of placing your little routine. And then you would be calling uh, that little routine from, from patch data of the loader. And so it's overloading that very convenient little area where you typically could hide your routines. Uh, here it overloads the very end of the stack uh, and here it patches one byte of the loader. Uh, yeah, we could check if the, the previous value of that, but uh, let's not do that for the time being. And then it's overloading the, uh, the tape buffer again. So the tape buffer is, of course, the most available routine for... Uh, to apply patches to. So if if uh, Cyberload now overloads, that probably means that it will overwrite any potential patches you have applied. So this is uh, this is doing this up until address 0391, and then it's loading another file, and then it's patching more 0392 uh, up to a seven, I guess, four, five, six, possibly. So why not do this in one go? Well, whatever. Uh, John Twitty is a smart guy, so I'm, I'm sure he had a reason for doing it this way. The next, so, and the end of this, so the, the end of the boot file is calling address two. The end of this is calling C1000. And what this has also done, it has loaded this secondary loader. Uh, and here it's not doing that much of decryption anymore because it's sort of already messed with that. So if you manage to get to this point, you probably know how to bypass the, uh, the decryption. Uh, so this is a routine that does the rest of the loading until it loads uh, the, <laughs> the type 3. And now type 3 is, is an interesting thing. What it does, it loads a block, so 256 bytes of memory, and it adds a header file of 8 bytes. That header file can contain a number of parameters. It's probably loading start where that block is going in memory, uh, and I don't think it needs to be on even addresses. No, it doesn't, no. Uh, but there are also parameters for, uh, okay, so now execute the jump. So when it has loaded a number of blocks, it can trigger by the header of the next block, trigger calling of uh, like initialize music player or uh, run the routine that presents the picture. Uh, let's see. So this is 089 a b c d here they are all sequential e f 11 12 okay and here you can see two pauses and now it's loading to e thousand so this was uh, an additional part of the loader and uh, and what it loads now is pure data so the, the next section it's loading here from E1000 is the Hunter's Moon picture. Uh, let's see where that one... F... E... and then FF. So here it loads to FF3F, is it? Let's see... FF3F, yes. So it's loading a bitmap. So 
from E1000 up to FF3F, a bitmap. And then it starts loading to CC. Uh, I would imagine that's the character, uh, or rather the, yeah, screen or, or color memory. We don't know which one. It's not loading directly to the screen memory, so uh, to, to the color memory. So this is a little routine. Let's see what that one do, does. Oh yeah. So you see here the routine at uh, BF80. It's copying the four pages it just loaded onto the uh, color memory. That means that the the, the area around uh, CC00 is now free because the, the relevant information is already copied to color memory. And then it starts loading to CC again because now it's going to load the actual uh, screen memory. Yes, and, and then it's doing something else. Oh yeah, it's showing the picture. So the parameter uh, for this was probably stating that it's loading from uh, BF80 and one of the eight byte parameters is indicating that please execute me on my start address. And then it's showing the picture. And from here on it's loading 1400. Um, it loaded up to I thought it was only 12 something, but now it's loading from 1400 and it's loading and loading and loading and loading. And uh, I think it's doing this basically sequentially. Uh, let's, yeah. And then at one point in time when it's uh, reaching higher memory here, uh, could that be here? You see pauses here. BB, BC. And look what it's doing here. It's loading something into the stack. So it's, this looks like a cleaning routine of some sort. And it looks like something it will do before it starts the game, right? So uh, 2F and uh, in zero and 36 in a one. And then this is one of the reset routines, clearing the, uh, the zero page, clearing address the page two and page three uh yeah it's yeah so and this is copying all the vectors back and then it's calling 081b so i guess when we are here it's setting the routine for whatever is going to start the game um, if I recall correctly, this game is actually frozen with the expert cartridge, <coughs> which means that uh, this is the start address of the expert depacker. And then it's probably going to overload the lower part of memory. It started loading at 1400 and then because from 0800 to 12 something was uh, a part of the loader and now it's overloading that with some other stuff. Yeah, and then, yeah, it loaded up until 1400 hours, 13 FF. And then it loads, and then it then it kickstarts the, the program. I don't know where it, it, it did this jump to uh, the stack routine that we just saw, but uh, yeah, for the purpose of this, uh, this was just an exploration of what you can do and how loaders are structured. This is Cyberload, this is probably the most complex one. We can have a similar session if the, the interest is there with one of the other loaders. And if you would like to understand any part of, of Cyberload anymore, then just comment down below and, and we will look into if it's a feasible request that we can start producing material for. Uh, for. Uh, but for for the time being, I think I'm going to conclude and saying thank you for watching and welcome to the next episode of Ally TV. Oh, I thought we were done, but no, there is one little thing. I promised you one thing during uh, the previous presentation and that was give a rationale why I wanted you to tick this one, link sequential blocks on export. 
we get back to the, the view here. So tools has a number of options and one of them is export to PRG. If we do that, it looks like nothing happened, but something actually happened. So what the program does now is that it's exporting the PRG file or exporting the data from the tape to uh, um, some sort of folder on the hard disk. Uh, if you haven't ticked that little tick box, it would save each and every block that we have seen in Cyberload as a separate file, which is very inconvenient. So what that check, check did was that now the program builds the sectors next to one another into one file and exports them as one chunk. So the file is... is you would have fewer files and they are bigger files and when the so the 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 entire bitmap is not made out of i don't know 20 32 blocks it's made out of one file uh, so i would strongly suggest you to tick that box unless you have a specific purpose to uh, why you wouldn't want that um, like that but I mean, the, the only thing we can say in addition to this was that, okay, so selecting export PRG, here you have my way. Uh, so here it exported Hunter's Moon 1987 Thalamus. Um, and so here are the files from that was, they were the ones exported from the tape. And you probably recognize most of them. Here you would see the File 11 is the bitmap here from E1000 to FF40, so the bitmap there. Uh, and we agreed that this was the color memory and then the little routine that copied the color memory and then there was the screen memory and then the little routine that uh, fired up showing the, uh, the picture and then the big chunk here from 1400 to BC72. So the latter part of the main file and then the little file that eventually is going to launch the program and then it's loading from 0800 to 1400 so filling the little gap before here and then I'm sure it's it's calling 01A0. I would strongly advise you to take a look at Tapex. It's a great program. The only thing that severely annoys me was the thing I just pointed out. There is no requester that would enable you to select the destination folder for exporting your PRGs. It would probably take Tom five minutes to implement that feature, but I don't know why he doesn't want to have that. So use the opportunity of logging into csdp csdb.dk and then search for tapex <clears throat> so tapex 1.6 is the most recent version and and tom is there stated as the author do send him a personal message asking why we cannot have a requester where you can select the output directory for where you want your prg files exported please do that for me Bye-bye, and very nice having you here. See you next time.